God bless you. Welcome to Rima International Bible Church and welcome to the last month of the year, December. I have a word to help you finish the year strong. And that's the title of my message, Finishing Strong. I'm going to take you to Genesis 35 where we look at the story of Rachel and the birth of her second son. Let's go into the service and let's get a word from the mouth of God to help us finish the year strong. Greetings from Rima International Bible Church here in Silver Spring, Maryland, and welcome to the month of December. Amazing God has been great. God has brought us from January through December, and maybe you're tired and a little bit weary. I have a word to encourage you so you reach the finish line, and today's message title is Finishing Strong. I'm praying that God will give you the grace and the strength to finish the year strong so that you can transition into the next year because guess what? God has some great things in your future. Um, the text is from Genesis chapter 35, and um, it's the death of Rachel. The death of Rachel. Uh, I'll be reading from verses 16 through 19, and I kindly ask you in the house to please rise so we read it together. Let's read it with power. The death of Rachel, um, verse 16. Let's go at the count of three. One, two, three. Then they moved on from Bethel. Let's read with power. While there was still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. Can I hear you? And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni. But her, his father named him Benjamin. 19. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Amen. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath. That is Bethlehem. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for bringing us this far into the year in this final month. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your salvation and your deliverance and your protection and your, and your preservation. Thank you for life. Thank you for health. I thank you, God. As we look into this final month of the year, may your grace be upon us. May you finish the good work that you have begun in our lives, O oh God. Father, you are faithful, God. I commit our time into your hands. Always bring us a word as you do, O oh God. Bring us a, 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 a Rima word. Bring us a Rima word. A word in season, a word that will instruct, a word that will guide, a word that will save us, O oh God, a word that will encourage us. Father, I thank you. Finally, I commit myself into your hands, O oh God. Anoint me to bring your word with clarity so that all the hearers will be blessed. I ask you this in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may take your seats. Hallelujah. Finishing strong. January to December is, uh, is, is, is quite a journey. It's quite, and we never know how that journey will go. We never know how, what happens on the journey. We are anticipating a new year next year, and we don't know. We just, we're just going to go into it by faith. But usually around this time, many people are fatigued. Emotionally fatigued, spiritually fatigued, financially fatigued relationally fatigued, there, there is general tiredness, and, and that is what this message is uh, going to address so that we will be recharged and we will continue to run our race and finish well so that come the end of the year, we would have exhausted everything that God required us to do. Amen. So the background to Genesis 35, God instructs Jacob, to return to Bethel in Canaan um, and settle there after some 20 long years working for his uncle Laban. You remember Jacob fled from his brother after that transaction, after he stole his birthright. 
And he was in Padan Aram with his uncle, working for his uncle for a good 20 years. God says, leave and go back. And when you go build an altar there to me, and build it where I appear to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Those are his marching orders. Jacob obeys and instructs Leah and Rachel, his two wives, their servants, and the entire clan to get rid of the foreign gods, purify themselves, and change their clothes. This is Genesis 35. So God shows up to Jacob and says, okay, this chapter of your life is over, and I want you to go back home. I want you to go back home. And this is the journey. It's just like running from January through to December. The journey back home is estimated to be anything from 380 to about 450 miles. That's like traveling from here, Maryland, to Massachusetts. About that. And they are going to be traveling on Camelback. No nice cars, no nice coaches, <laughs> no trains. And imagine this, it's a whole tribe moving by caravan over these several hundreds of miles. And oh, it includes children. By this time, Jacob has 11 children. He has 11 children. And think about the nightmare or the logistical challenge of transporting or carting wealth that is accumulated over 20 years. Think about it. You moved into a house. It was huge. It was big. In one year, all of a sudden, you filled the house, right? That's what happens. You move into a house, and then you, you pick this, and you bring this in, and you bring this furniture piece. And all of a sudden, you have so much. And if you have to move again... You're like, where did all this come from? Jo Jacob had been working for his uncle for 20 years and had amassed wealth, and now they have to move with all this wealth in a caravan. That's not an easy task, and if you add the rocky start of that journey, it makes it even more traumatic. As they left, Laban followed them and went to search them because Rachel stole the household gods. So this is, the, this is the setting. It's a pretty challenging trip. It's exciting that he, he gets to go back home, but the logistics of it, the mechanics of it is not that exciting. It's a trip that will wear you out. It's a trip that will, will wear you out. It's, it's a challenging task just to travel from point A to point B, and God says go, and so they set out to go, and the Bible says they arrive in Bethel in Canaan. He builds an altar. He calls the place El Bethel. Then the story begins. The story I want to bring to you today. They move over from Bethel after the sacrifice, after the altar, and the Bible says that while they were still some distance from Ephrath, that is Bethel, Rachel began to give birth. Rachel begins to give birth. They have, they have not yet settled into their final destination. They are in the region, but they are still traveling. And you will think that the birthing of this new child will wait till they settle down and everything is even so that the baby will come. No, the baby does not wait for that. Birth just happens before they finally settle down. Now, we have our own romantic and perfect scenarios where life must be born. We have our own preconceived ideas that this must be in place and that must be in place and this must be okay and this must be straight. Then when everything is ready, then the baby, then life will be born, but it doesn't work that way. It doesn't, it rarely works that way. God is the giver of life. 
God is the giver of life. God gives human life. God gives life into businesses, into ministries, into, into, into companies. Into, God is the giver of life. He is the giver of life. And he gives life on his own terms. He gives life. Sometimes life is born at the worst times, but it's life nonetheless. Now, if you don't understand this, when God is bringing life, you will not receive it. Because this is the worst time for a woman to give birth. She's exhausted. And the life that wants to come out does not wait for the perfect time. The life that God wants to bring to you will not wait for the perfect time. But you have to be smart enough to pick it when God brings you life. Life in your education, life in your family, life in your business, life in your marriage, life in your, in, in whatever you do, life in your ministry. When the life shows up, receive the life. Because after all, God is the life giver. John 11 and 25 says that I am the resurrection and the what? And the life. God is the resurrection. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he's all about bringing life. And so in the midst of a pandemic, he brings life. You're going through a, a terrible divorce and then he brings life. You're going through a difficult separation life. You just got fired from the job and God brings life. You just got demoted and God brings life. You have to be smart to know that this is life and I can use life. You just filed a bankruptcy and then God turned around and brought you life. You went through a major disappointment and God says, here is life. There is even life in the grave. There was life in Lazarus' grave. There was life in Jesus' grave. Amen. So they are traveling. They are not yet at their final destination. Rachel has been traveling while pregnant. And in her economy, she would say, this life begins to come out at the wrong time. There is nothing like a wrong time because God is the giver of life. God is the giver of life. You need prophetic eyes. You need prophetic lenses to be able to identify life. You need to be able to drown out all the noise and say, yes, I can see everything going around about me, but this is life that God is giving to me. And you should be able to isolate everything around you and receive the life. Because God is always giving life. God doesn't always give life in conducive circumstances. That would make him less than God. He's sovereign. So when he decides to give life, he decides all by himself. And he gives the life. <laughs> Where do you expect to find life? I hope you will reorient your, your thinking and be more on the lookout for life. God gives life in the desert and he gives life in dry places. He gives life where there are ashes and he gives life when people are mourning. As I said, he gave life in the tomb of Lazarus and please don't limit God because God is the life giver. Can you shout amen? amen? Now, Rachel goes into labor, essentially. And scripture says that she began to give birth and had great difficulty. Can you say great difficulty? Rachel had great difficulty birthing the child because Birthing a child, birthing anything is difficult work. It is difficult work to birth a child or to birth anything. It is difficult to birth a human. It is difficult to birth a business. It is difficult to birth a ministry. It is difficult to raise children. It is difficult. Sometimes we get shocked. How is it so difficult? Well, Scripture says that Rachel began to give birth with great difficulty. Don't be surprised. Don't go into birthing 
assuming that it's easy. It's, it's hard work. Students, you are birthing a career with your education. That's hard work. That's hard work. Childbearing is God partnering with man. God has the divine part. God brings the life, but he uses a human vessel to produce the life in this natural realm. But we would have to do some work. Even Jesus Christ found it difficult to birth eternal life for us. The Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed and he said, If possible, let this cup pass over me, but let it be your will, not mine. On the cross, he had to endure pain and suffering as he was birthing new life for all of us. Eternal life, that is. So while we desire to have the baby, while we desire to birth the child, let us also be cognizant of the fact that it takes work to birth things. And God requires that we will put in the work. God requires that we will partner with him and put in the effort so that life can be born. Amen. Giving birth is obviously not for the faint-hearted. So Rachel goes into labor and she has great difficulty giving birth. And then the midwife who is trying to help her bring forth this child says to her, don't despair. Can you say don't despair? Don't despair. For you have another son. Don't despair. Rachel has a first son, Joseph. And this next one is yet to be named. So in the agony, in the fight, in the struggle, in the, in the, in, 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 in the work, in the hard work, in the toil of bringing life into the situation of birthing this new child, the midwife does something pretty strategic. She says, don't despair. Despair means to lose hope completely. Don't lose hope. The journey has not yet come to an end. Don't run out of steam. Don't run out of hope. The reason people commit suicide is because they run out of hope. The reason people throw in the towel is because they exhausted hope. They could no longer see any light at the end of the tunnel. The, the midwife says, don't despair. And today, God's word to you, wherever you are, is don't despair. Don't lose hope. Stay focused. There is another child about to be born. The midwife wanted to focus Rachel's attention on the life that was coming out. On the new life. Yes, you are struggling in pain and everything, but I want you to focus on the life that is coming out of you. And that will energize you, that will encourage you, that will motivate you to bring forth this life. So she says, don't despair for you have another son. Look at the son that you are, you've been carrying the son for nine months. You've been doing so much work already. Look at the son that is about to be born. And don't run out of hope. Hope is a very essential thing in life. Hope gets us through life. Hope gets us through difficult situations. Hope gets us through impossible situations. Hope is vital. Never run out of hope. Never despair. Ecclesiastes 9 and 4 says anyone who is among the living has hope. Doesn't matter how terrible how difficult, how agonizing, how impossible it is. If you have breath in your nostrils, you are in a good place. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. You might be a champion, but if you're out of this earth realm, you, you have no hope. But if only you are here in this natural body, you have hope. Amen. Church, don't despair. Don't despair. So the midwife encourages Rachel to look at the son that she's about to give birth to. 
And a son means a great deal in their tradition. So she was trying to encourage and look at the son that you are. And today God sent me to tell him, look at the son, look at the child that you are about to give birth to. You've been working for 11 months towards some goals. Look at the fruit of your labor that is about to be born. And use that as fuel to continue the race and finish strong. Amen. Don't despair for you have another son. Don't despair for you have another son. Now it's interesting that Two things are intersecting in this story. Two unlikely things. Life and death. Death and life have come to a junction in this one story. And that is true of life and that is true of the way God works. Rachel's second son occurs at the junction of her death. And that is because oftentimes death and life intersect. Very important. Death and life often intersect. There is a life at every point of death in your life. And I want you to begin to look back. At every point in your life where something died, life was being born. Just like this story. Rachel was dying. The second son was being born and the two were intersecting. At the places where you died, where something failed, where you lost something precious, God was also given life at the same time. Because God is a redemptive God. God is a sovereign God. And God is always doing a new thing. The places where you have the greatest regrets, my friend, if you go back, you'll be able to identify new life in that very space. Rachel is dying. A child is being born. Rachel is dying. Rachel is coming to the end of herself. And right there in that mess, God is bringing new life. And the same is true with your story. You said, this died and that died and I went through this, this failure and this disappointment and this tragedy and this disease and this situation and, 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 and all of that. Yes, if you look closely like happens in the story, as something was dying, God was also birthing new life. And you'll be very smart to keep your eye on the new life that God is doing. Scripture says that God is always doing a new thing. God, so while Rachel was dying, God was simultaneously bringing forth life, which is a new thing. Look for life anytime you see death. John 12, 24 says, Very truly I say unto you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and what? Dies. It remains by itself. But when it dies, then there can be life. So the two are going side to the, the, the grain of wheat must die for life to spring forth. So don't you just look at the grain of wheat that is dying, begin to look for the Life that is about to spring forth. Begin to look for that multiplication. Oftentimes we get so fixated on the death that we fail to see the child that is being born. Rachel is dying, but a second son is being born. And today, if you walk here with some death or if you're experiencing some death, I came to point to you that the second son is being born. And you need those prophetic lenses to see that son, that child, that dream, that, that vision that is being born at the same time as something else is dying. God is a redemptive God and he's sovereign. And the death of one thing does not bar him from bringing new life. It's all about perspective. So it's all about how you see things. For some of you, your death was um, closed doors. You did everything right, and they shut the door on your face. That was the death. The life is that God used that to redirect your path. And you step into some spaces that you never dreamed of, and you flourish. The death produced life. For some of you, your death was some adversity or some tragedy or some trial you went through. 
It was bitter. It was cruel. It was torturous. The life that it produced was that it made you a stronger person. It developed, a, it developed tenacity. You became a tenacious person. And today, because of that experience, you can walk through impossible areas where people just can't imagine. So that death produced life. That's why I said, wherever you find death in your life, look for life. Wherever you see Rachel dying, look for a second son being born. Because God is at work. Amen. So there is a life at the junction of death. That's something you want to write. There is a life at the junction of death. You need prophetic lenses to look for the life. Where is the son that I see? I see Rachel die, but there has to be a son being born. There is life at the junction of death. Isaiah 41 says that I will make rivers flow on barren heights. Barren heights is death. But God will cause rivers. River is life. And springs within the valleys. Deserts in pools of water. Deserts into pools of water. Desert is death, but God brings life, pools of water right from there. Parch grounds into springs. Parch grounds, that's death and life coexist, and God bringing life in the parch ground. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia. In the desert, in the desert, God will cause Life to spring forth, and today may God cause life to spring forth in your desert. Amen. Amen. And the myrtle and the olive, I will set junipers in the wasteland. Wasteland. Wasteland stands for death. But God is a redemptive God. God is sovereign. So in that wasteland, he will cause junipers to spring up. Anytime you find death, look out for life. Anytime you see Rachel dying, look for that child that is being born because God is a redemptive God. Even in the Garden of Eden when the dream died, God set a system in place to bring life. Scripture talks about the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the earth. That is how God operates. When there is death, he has to bring life because he is the resurrection and the life. So if there is no point sitting and crying over death, look for the life because God is bringing life right out of that death situation. The Garden of Eden, big tragedy. And out of that, God brings life. So the story continues that Rachel doesn't seem to be making it. Verse 18, Genesis 35, she breathes her last. The Bible says, for she was dying. For she was now, they're, they're still traveling. And this, this, this event is happening while they're traveling, so they have to stop temporarily and attend to Rachel. And the Bible says that as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Benoni. She named her son Benoni, meaning son of my sorrows. Son of my sorrows. Rachel's story is similar to Jabez. The mother delivered, conceived and delivered him in pain and therefore assigned a name that was representative of the experience she went through. Mother is dying. She is still awake enough to understand that this is a son and in the death, She's conscious enough to know that this is a son and she finds a name that she considers to be most appropriate and she says, I will name you son of my sorrows and that will be the last significant thing I do on this earth. I will give you a name to characterize my experience. I will give you a name so that you will never forget the pain I went through. 
And that's a mistake we often make. God is bringing forth new life at the junction of death. The two don't have anything to do in common. The two are two separate things. Death is occurring because that's the way of life. But at the same time, God in his infinite wisdom is bringing forth life. The child is being born. The mother who is experiencing the death, the mother who has gone through trauma and pain and heartache, wants to take that experience and slap it on to the new thing that God is doing. That's a tragedy. That is what not to do. God is always doing a new thing. He says, see, I am doing a new thing. See, it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? But oftentimes we behave just like Rachel. We take our past bad experiences and we slap it on to the brand new thing that God is doing and we contaminate and we mar and we destroy the good thing that God is doing so that it negates the new thing that God was doing. You work for a company that didn't treat you well. You moved on. God opened a new door. And it's a new space, new people, new policies. But you carried that old painful experience into this new company. And from day one, you decided all by yourself that everybody in the company is bad. Everybody's not bad. It's your experience. You have renamed this good company bad. You went from one relationship that was not great into a new relationship and then you carried the experience of the bad relationship into the new relationship and then you said, this new person is bad. No, you just carried that bad experience and you slapped it on to this new one. It happens in churches. People move from one church to the next and they say, this church is bad. No, you brought the bad experience over here. God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. Rachel's death has nothing to do with this child being born. Rachel was unable to separate her pain from the new life. So she combined both and said, this is as bad as my experience. No, you are dying, we get it, but this is life. This child, you have no idea what God is going to do. So it is not right, it is not legitimate, it is not correct to label the child son of my sorrows. Don't label the new life that God is giving you son of my yesterday experience. Don't take a label from your past experience and slap it on the new thing that God is doing. In your marriage, in your business, in your ministry, in your family, with your children. Don't take a bad label and slap it on to today and say, see, this is a bad experience. God said, I'm doing a new thing. And we better be careful what we name things because as the man thinks, so is he. And, and words are spiritual. Don't mar the new thing God is doing by holding on to your last painful experience. God is inexhaustible. He doesn't run out. Definitely deal with your past. Whether it's counseling or prayer or fasting or therapy, deal with it, but don't bring the past and slap it onto the new thing that God is doing. You will negate, you will destroy, because God wants to give you a new experience. He doesn't want you to go around calling your son Benoni, Son of my sorrows. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Isaiah 43, 19. Do you not perceive it? She didn't, Rachel didn't perceive the new thing. She didn't perceive it. She, she, she was so stuck in the pain that she couldn't perceive that God was bringing light, and, and sometimes that is our experience. We are, so, we are so entrenched in the past, in the pain, that we cannot perceive that, friend. God is doing a new thing. Don't be stuck on the old thing. God moved away from that long time ago. 
He turned the wheels and, and you are still lingering in yesterday. And you cannot embrace the new thing that God is doing. The father is smart. The father is smart. The father jumps in immediately to, to correct this error. Rachel names the son, son of my sorrows. And the father knows the significance of that label. The father says, no, I'll name him differently. I'll call him Benjamin. I'll call him Benjamin. Benjamin means son of my right hand. So the same experience is perceived differently by two people. The woman who was in labor because of her pain transfers that bitterness, that pain, that sorrow onto the child and slaps that label on the child. And the man who produced the seed stands aside and says, that will be a distraction. Yes, you might be dying and we regret that you are dying, but it doesn't mean that should cost the son his whole life. And for that reason, I will repeal that name. I will change, I will erase that name and I will give him a better name. And the father says, I will call him Benjamin, son of my right hand. Same experience, different perspectives. And so the father renames and rebrands, gives the situation a new identity, calls it by a different name, shifts from the negative to the positive looks for life in the face of death and says, I'm going to take this experience and call it life because this looks like life to me. Let me separate the death and let me exalt. Let me embrace the new life. Let me exalt the life. I'm not going to allow this death to negate. It's bad enough that I'm losing a spouse. But if I have to lose a son in addition, then that's double trouble. And I'll choose life where I see life. So some of us need to give some experiences, some new names. When it was usually known as failure, call it lessons learned. Call it a growth opportunity. When it was a disappointment, call it redirection. When it was a rejection, look at the same thing and say, God used this rejection to redirect my path. Look at it with prophetic lens and look for the life that God is bringing in the face of death. That was Jacob's astuteness. He says, I'm not going to buy this. I will use my mouth to call this life because I see God doing a new thing while my wife is dying. While I'm going through the worst experience of my life, I can still see God. If this is not God, this child will not be born because God is the life giver. Friend, look in your life. Look into your life. On many occasions, God has been bringing forth life. And most of the time, we miss that life because we were so fixated on the death that occurred, on that unfortunate, tragic situation. I get it. But because God is a love, while that was going on to redeem the situation, God just showed up and brought life. So the story concludes by saying Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem, verse 19. So Rachel died and was buried on the way. God does not want you to die on the way. When you start a journey, God wants you to finish the journey. She died out of exhaustion, maybe fatigue, 
Definitely despair. Maybe disappointment. Maybe she was injured. She sat on a camel for all this time. But this tells me that long distances kill people. Long distances kill people. That is why you must keep your eyes on life, not death. You must keep your eyes on, on, on the victories, not on the defeats. You must rename some bad experiences with good names so that you will be focused on the life that God is bringing. Long distance kills. It kills. Like January through December. Just a week ago, we attended a, a brother's homegoing celebration. He was out. Long distances kill. But you have to keep your eyes on the child that is being born so that you are not in despair. Now, it's very interesting to know one thing that what killed Rachel didn't kill Benjamin. As I bring this to an end. What killed Rachel was in labor. Rachel had been carrying this child for months on this arduous journey, on this tedious journey. Rachel had been struggling. And you will think that her injury, her pain, her trouble would transfer unto the child. It did not. Now who is stronger, the mother or the child? Yeah. Yeah. But whatever it was, was able to take Rachel out and leave the infant baby. That fragile baby survived because that baby was not contaminated with the external things that Rachel was dealing with. Rachel was, was faced with despair and she was unable to overcome despair. The child had no concept of despair, so the child didn't lose hope. The child was just expecting to be born, and he was born. And even though mother tried to transfer that experience onto the child, it didn't affect the child. The child was born. Don't despair. Between the two of them, one was in despair, one was not. The infant child, that fragile child, a few pounds by weight. That fragile child was able to survive the harsh conditions, travel the whole distance. Who? The child, the infant child survived. But the mother, don't despair. Don't despair. There can be life in the presence of death. There can be springs of water in barren places. There can be oak trees in wastelands. Keep your eyes on the promise. You can have life in the face of death. I came to encourage you today to finish strong. Whatever you started at the beginning of the year, finish strong. Don't despair. Don't be tired. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Seek the Lord. Wait upon the Lord for strength, for new strength, because God is bringing new life. For our partners at home, I want to thank you for joining us this Sunday morning, uh, this December. I pray that God will strengthen you. I pray that you will not despair. Look unto God who is the supplier of life. And by the way, if you need eternal life, it can only be found in Jesus Christ. So if you've not received the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've not received this new thing that God has done through his son Jesus Christ, I want you to open your mouth and say, Heavenly Father, I receive the gift of your son Jesus Christ. And today I turn over my life to you. If that's you, you got born again, write to us. We'll be happy to mail you a Bible at no cost. If you are in our area, Silver Spring, Maryland, join us for 
Sunday in person worship. We would love to fellowship with you. But remember, God sent me to come and encourage you to finish strong. Don't despair. Receive this word, church, and be blessed. Amen. God is birthing life in the face of your death. Don't be discouraged. Don't despair. Meditate on this word and share it with your community. I want to take a moment to thank our partners who support us with online giving. Thank you for bringing life to this ministry, for helping us extend our reach to the nations of the world. We bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. If you're local, join us for in-person worship. If you've never been able to support the work we do, I kindly ask you to consider a gift in support of this work. God bless you from Rima International Bible Church. Join us again next Sunday for another Rima word from the mouth of God.